The information provided in the following program is not a substitute for or intended to be medical advice. Medical advice can only be provided to you by your personal physician. Hello again and welcome to a brand new edition of the award-winning JFK Spotlight on Health. It is Bert Barron and thank you for joining us once again. This will be the healthiest 30 minutes of your entire week, so thank you so much for spending some time with us. For our segment today, we're bringing back some of our great special guests who we've had in the past. And you know when it's uh, we had the polar vortex that came through last week and you were kind of cozied up in, in your bed and nice and snug? Well, there are certain heroes and certain individuals that whether it's a polar vortex or not, they drop everything and spring into action and save lives. So the guests that we're going to be talking to today and kind of revisiting are from the Hackensack Meridian Health uh, Hospitals and the EMS uh, services that are provided. Let's introduce our special guests who are here. Better yet, I'll I'll have our guests uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Michelle, why don't we start with you, if you could introduce yourself and your title, and we'll just kind of go right around the table if we could. Sure. Thank you very much. My name is Michelle Kobayashi. I am the Administrative Director of EMS up at Hackensack Meridian Health, Hackensack University Medical Center. And to your left, we have John, right? Hi, I'm uh, John Izet. I'm the Senior Vice President at Alert Ambulance Service. Awesome. And to your left, uh, we're welcoming back. Uh, Mark, you were with us the last time, right, Mark? Yes, thanks for having me back, Bert. My name is Mark Bober. I'm the Director for EMS Services at JFK Medical Center within Hackensack Meridian Health. Awesome. And great to have everybody back on the program today. Mark, why don't we jump in with you? And uh, the, the age-old question, we'll address that right at the beginning here, the old EMS versus EMT. Uh, there's differences. There's similarities. You want to just kind of give us the uh, the Reader's Digest version of the differences between the two? Of course. Great place to start every time uh, because it really is one of those things that's a little bit confusing. So when you call 911, Uh, Your call is screened by an emergency medical dispatcher, and depending on what the chief complaint or the problem is, uh, you may or may not get one ambulance or you may get two ambulances. Uh, For the sixth of the sick, you not only get the EMTs or the basic life support uh, who show up in the ambulance, and they could be paid, they could be volunteers, they could be municipal, they could be hospital-based like ours, Uh, but in those instances, which are like strokes or heart attacks or cardiac arrest, of course, you'll also get the paramedics, and the paramedics usually show up in another vehicle and paramedics are only hospital-based in the state of New Jersey. So that's the advanced life support layer when you call 911. So it's kind of like this is like the jump-in point where lives are saved, and getting this expertise and this knowledge right at that moment where that critical care is required uh, oftentimes makes a big difference in saving someone, right? Absolutely. And uh, you can think of the advanced life support response as bringing the emergency room to you. The EMTs do a lot to stabilize. Uh, They can do CPR, administer oxygen, Uh, put ADs or defibrillators on people. Uh, But when it comes to the medications and the invasive procedures that would happen in the emergency room, that's where the advanced life support comes in. A question for you, Michelle, and it sounds like just coordinating communication sounds like a big part of what you do. There's a lot of moving parts here, and you're working with different uh, agencies uh, really on a statewide basis now with the uh, the affiliation with uh, with HMH. Uh, Communication and working well with with the communities and all the personnel involved is a a critical part of the operation, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, One of the things that we have as part of uh, Hackensack University Medical Center, we have a communication center that not only serves uh, Hackensack University Medical Center, but also serves Bergen, Passaic, and Morris counties. So we've been working on um, what we dispatch paramedics, EMTs, critical care transport, and helicopter programs in northern New Jersey. But we also work with police and fire and uh, other agencies to coordinate our work with the uh, partners that we have in the community. And you got me with the helicopter part right there because this is a vital part of the service. So oftentimes, uh, seconds really count when it comes to saving lives. And to have that availability, as they say, scramble the chopper. And I think about uh, Schwarzenegger was like, you know, use the chopper. But it, seriously, ha- having that available to you really on a 24-7 basis c- can make a big difference also, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's just times when those minutes do count and getting somebody to the place where we call definitive care, the thing where we can actually make that difference and, and step in. Um, getting them off of the highway and into a trauma center or even from another hospital. Maybe they're at a hospital that is um, not a trauma center, for example, Um, and getting them to a trauma center or to a stroke center, uh, really that makes a big difference in patient outcomes. Excellent. And and that leads me to the next question that I had for John, because it seems like no matter where I am in the state, I'll oftentimes see a vehicle that's got your logo and your colors and your, your brand and whatnot on it. And I'm wondering, okay, are they transporting a person or are they going to a call, maybe coming back from a call? Uh, this sort of transportation that you do, John, and another thing that's kind of difficult and, and challenging to coordinate, but it's an important thing of just moving patients from point A to point B. It seems like that takes a lot of coordination also. 
Sure, Bert. Uh, within the Hackensack Meridian Health Network, <clears throat> we're moving well over 100,000 patients a year, uh, not just to and from the hospitals or not just to the hospitals during an emergency, but once they arrive at the hospital, uh, they may need to be moved to a higher level of care. So if they're at a community hospital, they need to be uh, moved to a tertiary center. Uh, We're doing a lot of that patient movement. And what it does is it frees up beds in the emergency room, um, and then as the patients are uh, brought up onto the floors when they're admitted, uh, eventually when they get discharged, uh, oftentimes they they need to be moved out of the hospital so that he could free up more beds. So a lot of what we're doing is is transporting patients uh, throughout the entire network, and and there's a lot of uh, patient movement going on. How many many miles did you put on your trucks last year, John? uh, Alert Ambulance Service, uh, we have uh, about 105 vehicles ourselves. I think as a network, we're closer to 200 vehicles. But just Alert Ambulance alone, uh, we did 3.1 million miles in uh, 2018. Wow. Yeah. That's remarkable. That's a lot of points at the gas pump there. Good for you guys. <laughs> wow. Man, oh, man. And, uh, Mark, I think the last time you were here, we were talking about some nice, uh, I guess, accreditations or some nice recognitions uh, that your system uh, had garnered. Uh, and it is uh, it, uh, the affiliation now, it's even more of a level of respect, right? It's sort of even elevated the profile. Uh, and, and the recognition that you receive on a statewide, if not a national basis, is something that everyone strives for, right? Definitely. And I think what we've found is we've started to work together and we've started to sort of combine the cultures of the different agencies under HMH is that we all really are experts in a slightly different facet of EMS. Uh, Michelle actually just achieved an accreditation yesterday uh, specific to the air medical side of the world. And when it comes to transport, uh, you know, John's world, uh, alert ambulance is second to none. So it really is kind of developing synergies at at this point between all the things that we have historically been good at and how we can either share best practice or learn from each other. Yeah, it's it's a critical thing. I'm curious to know as to how many years of service all of you have with regards to what you're doing now. Michelle, is this something you've been doing a while now? Well, um, you could say that. So when I was 16, I became an EMT, and that's how I got into healthcare. Uh, so me personally, I've been in healthcare since the early 90s. Um, I came back to EMS in 2014. I'm a nurse, so I worked in the hospital as a nurse in between. But uh, coming back to EMS has been really exciting. Awesome. And thank you for your service, of course, as a nurse and what you're doing now. How about you, John? How long have you been involved in this? Uh, I became a volunteer EMT when I was a uh, sophomore in high school, so a long time ago. It's uh, greater than 25 years now. I wound up uh, becoming a paramedic uh, just over 20 years ago. And I've been uh, in management, on the management side of it for about uh, 12 years now. But uh, I still actually work as a paramedic on Friday nights in a uh, a paramedic unit. I I enjoy it that much. Good. That's awesome. And, Mark, I think we talked about this last time as well, that not only have you been doing this for a while, we even talked about this is a a viable career. This is a great career. This is an in-demand career that's never going to go away. There's always going to be a demand for good people like yourself. Yeah, you're not kidding. Uh, I'm definitely the baby at this table as far as years of experience go. But, um, you know, to your point, I can think of really only one time in my entire EMS career where I only held one job. At one point, I had four jobs because if you have this skill set and if you really are good at what you do, um, not only from the medical side, but the customer service side as well, the sky really is the limit. You're in demand. Yep, that's how it's done. We're going to come back. We'll spend some more time with Michelle and John and Mark when we come back on a very special edition of JFK Spotlight on Health, the wonderful people here with Hackensack Meridian Health EMS. We'll come back, spend some more time with them next. We are back on JFK Spotlight on Health. My guests are the amazing people who are involved with the Hackensack Meridian Health EMS services. And we're talking about the wider range of services that they offer. And if you'd like to get some more information, there's a terrific website. It's really sort of an all-encompassing that involves the entire Hackensack Meridian Health Network and all the great partners now that really on a statewide level, they are bringing really just great care to so many people here in New Jersey. And the website, very simply, spell out all the words. It's Hackensack Meridian Health. Dot org And there's great information there. Michelle and John and Mark are all here. Uh, Mark, let's talk about what they call the frontline team. And these are the people, it's sort of the boots on the ground sort of people that are involved with this, that keep this and execute the uh, the mission on a day-in, day-out basis. How about a shout-out for the frontline front team and what they're all about? Yeah, absolutely, because there's no way we would be here without them. Uh, they are the ones, day in and day out, as you mentioned in your lead-in, that are out there. It doesn't matter if it's a holiday. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of the night. It doesn't matter if it's 40 degrees below with the wind chill in the middle of a polar vortex. As you said, there is no time when 911 calls that they do not answer. So for us, it really is about, you know, the utmost appreciation for our team members. And whether they're up on the helicopter or uh, in the back of the ambulance treating a patient on the way to the hospital, 
the work that they do uh, is completely and totally invaluable. And uh, let's face it, there are a growing number of patients every year, so we get busier every year. So they really are the true heroes in this equation. Yeah, I think back to that uh, that incredible, uh, I guess it was a paper plant fire from a couple weeks ago, and just some of the visuals that came with that and those bitter cold conditions and this raging fire and, and just how many people were, were putting their own lives on hold and kind of really going into harm's way to help others who might need their assistance. And, and it's people like that that are really just true heroes. And everybody who's with us here today is, is really a, a hero in my eyes, no doubt about it. Yeah, Bert, we were actually uh, part of the support team for the Markel paper fire because uh, it's in our it's in our area. And even though there weren't the ones running the scene, there were people that um, locally were running that program. Um, we did play a support role, and the the focus really was on the providers. It was on the firefighters and the the people that were there um, to keep them warm, to keep them safe. And uh, it was really proud of the team that day for the work that they did to uh, participate. Yeah, that was if there ever was an all hands on deck event uh, in our in our state, uh, that was certainly the one. And uh, Michelle, uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about some of the education programs and and how important it is uh, to get into to the schools and get into the communities and whatnot. One pro- program in particular that you offer is something called Stop the Bleed. You want to talk about what that's all about? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, we're actually partnering with our trauma service. Uh, as a trauma center, Stop the Bleed is really important. And really what it comes down to is if somebody is bleeding, it's using tourniquets. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about tourniquets. People are afraid of them. Oh, people's arms will fall off if you put a tourniquet on them. And that's just not true. So what we've been doing is working with school nurses, um, with the students, with the police officers and the EMS providers to make sure they're trained in how to use that. Um, schools now are putting up Stop the Bleed kits. In fact, um, the state conference for EMS this year uh, included uh, an award for a high school that put Stop the Bleed kits in their high school next to their defibrillators. Um, with all of the, the tragedies in the schools, having that type of medical knowledge minutes make a difference. And thank you for clarifying that because my upbringing, and I went to public school here in New Jersey, and there was always this basic sort of you know, first aid information and about things you can do and things you can't do. It always seemed like when it came to something like that of stopping someone's bleeding, there was very specific information or like it would be worst case scenario. But it, it, the idea is to educate people without scaring them, right? That's part of what you do. Absolutely. And these are things that kids can do. These are things that the teachers can do. You don't need to be a paramedic or an EMT or a flight nurse or a flight medic to be able to do this skill. This is just like doing CPR. It's another skill you can do as a first aid responder. Excellent. And uh, John, uh, getting back, if we could, about some career opportunities, and we mentioned about how the demand will always be there. Uh, is there a training component of uh, that goes along with this? If someone is maybe interested in pursuing this as, as a career, there is training that is provided for people that uh, maybe want to pursue it? Absolutely. And uh, it's actually a, a problem that we all face, uh, not just within Hackensack Meridian Health, but uh, everywhere in EMS in general, is that uh, th- there really isn't as many people coming into this field as, as we need. Um, as the population grows, as healthcare improves, there's more and more stuff that's being done out in the field uh, prior to people getting to the hospital. And we need more and more people to do that thing. Uh, to provide the care. So uh, in essence, uh, within the network, we start out at the very lowest of levels uh, with wheelchair van drivers. And uh, in essence, we would actually hire people uh, with no skill, no uh, no training, uh, no prior understanding of healthcare at all, and train them to be wheelchair drivers. While they're working as a wheelchair driver, we can actually uh, pay for their EMT class so that they can get that basic understanding and begin to become EMTs. And a lot of times, once they become the EMT and they're working in that field, they really do love it, and they decide to go on to become paramedics, or they go on and become nurses. And that's uh, one good way that we could actually kind of feed our industry with the employment that we really, really all need. Yeah, I can see, Mark, for something like this, where now you feel like you're part of something special and part of a team, and you probably can't help but get excited about the opportunities and, and what's out there for you to continue along your training and, and pursue this like a career because it, it's it's something that's that's real and it's there for so many people. Exactly. Uh, you know, my own personal experience, as soon as I left college, I, I started volunteering in my hometown of Tom's River. And before I knew it, I, I realized that there was more that I felt like I should be doing for those patients. And that, that was my push to go to paramedic school. And then from there, it was a short amount of time on the road as a paramedic before I had aspirations to join the flight team and be part of the medevac crew. And I really think that you sort of fall in love with the pace of it. You sort of fall in love with the stress of it. 
Um, it's, it's something that isn't for everybody, but it's something that definitely becomes a part of you if it is for you. And that's why we find so many people that are still very actively involved in the volunteer community, because even though they may have other jobs and other walks of life, they still really are rooted in this EMS background that was once such a big part of their lives. Yeah, and it's such an important thing, like you said, even at the municipal level, that people are involved, even on a volunteer basis. Uh, this, the, the fact that he, that even still exists and to know you have such great support systems like like the people that are here today uh, is really an important thing. We're going to come back. We have one more segment to go with our special guests who are here on this edition of the show. And again, for more information about any of the services that are offered, you could very simply visit the website, hackensackmeridianhealth.org. We have much more coming up next on JFK Spotlight on Health. I'm Michael. And I'm April. We're husband and wife, and together, we We lost lost nearly 200 pounds. pounds. Do you want to know our secret? We both went to the JFK for Life Surgical Weight Loss Program. JFK for Life is a comprehensive weight management program specializing in both surgical weight loss and non-surgical weight loss. Your journey will include an entire team of clinical experts located close to home, remaining with you for ongoing encouragement and support. From nutritionists to fitness counselors to board-certified surgeons, we know it's not the amount of weight you need to lose. It's how your life will be different once you lose the weight. JFK for Life has been recognized as a center of blue distinction from Blue Cross and an Aetna Institute of Quality. Why wait? Lose weight. Visit jfkforlife.org today. Learn more about JFK for Life and the success of more than 1,000 weight loss surgeries performed. Visit jfkforlife.org and watch our free weight loss seminar at your convenience. One more segment to go with our special guests here today from the Hackensack Meridian Health uh, EMS uh, workers who are here. Uh, remarkable work that they're doing. And again, for more information about them or really the entire Hackensack Meridian Health Network, you can visit HackensackMeridianHealth.org. Uh, Mark, it continues to be something that we struggle with uh, across our entire state here. No one is immune from, unfortunately, the scourge uh, of opioids. Uh, give us an update, if you would. And uh, I think about Narcan uh, being used on a statewide basis. And talk about what that's been like, uh, not only dealing with the epidemic as it continues to just kind of create problems for us, but uh, the education component of this and what you can do to perhaps sort of stem uh, the the stream, I guess, uh, of people that are getting addicted to this dangerous substance. Sure, Bert. I mean, the numbers definitely are not getting better. And although the spotlight is on the crisis, uh, what we've really found over the past couple of years is that it's just no longer enough to react to it when it's going on. There needs to be a proactive approach. And uh, for us in particular, that's taken shape in a program called Not Even Once. And I'd be remiss if I didn't credit Manchester PD uh, with the start of this program. They're the ones who actually created it with their Board of Education. Down in Ocean County, they obviously have a singularly unique problem uh, with opiate overdose. And so for them, uh, they decided that the scared straight approach really wasn't the way to go. And they created this this new program for um, schools, for any age, um, usually geared towards transitional ages within schools, but for police, fire, EMS, any first responders who are familiar with overdose and with the use of Narcan, to go in and really talk to people about the fact that it isn't just a bum under a bridge with a needle in his arm anymore. It could be, you know, an athlete who gets addicted to a painkilling substance. Uh, it could be a family member who, you know, is hiding an, an addiction in, you know, behind closed doors. So for us, it really has been kind of this shift to get into the uh, high schools in our areas. And uh, North Plainfield was actually the first uh, for us to uh, partner up with. And now we're uh, in the process of launching this in Metuchen and in uh, other areas throughout our primary response as well. Excellent. And it's people, that, Mark, that I know have been impacted by this that in a million years I would have never thought had a problem with this. Uh, a friend of mine had a daughter who was involved in, uh, I believe, an automobile accident and wound up uh, having to go into a, a recovery center not once but twice as a result of an addiction that – I never saw it coming, and I don't think anybody saw that coming. So, exactly. Uh, if you think that it's something that can't happen to you or it only happens to other people, well, guess what? You're the other person. So it's something that continues to be an issue and, and an important one here. And I'm glad you mentioned about Manchester because I've talked to a lot of people at various levels of health care and, and health providers. Something about Ocean County is almost thought of as being the ground zero, if you will, of this uh, this epidemic. Any reason as to why that geography would kind of be the first place to kind of the, put the pin in the map as to – how it got started? I think they were actually very progressive early on with identifying that there was a problem while many other places kind of just assumed that it was, like Mark said, kind of off off to the side, uh, especially over the summertime uh, when their population would swell. Um, sure, they have seaside and there was a lot of uh, overdoses on the seaside area, uh, but uh, 
I think it might have been the Ocean County Sheriff or, or some of the police departments within Ocean County, they identified that the, the, the problem was much larger than just, um, you know, kids overdosing on, 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 on uh, heroin. And uh, there were a lot of different pathways to addiction. Uh, so, so they really did kind of call the or sound the bell prior to anyone else doing it. So it is an issue that uh, continues to kind of grip our state, but uh, it's something that we're working against, and it's a really a day-to-day priority to, to combat something like this, right? Yes, it is. It is, okay. All right, uh, we were talking earlier now about uh, this, the, the resources now with, with Hackensack Meridian Health and this entire really virtually a statewide network now of outstanding care that's being provided. Uh, Michelle, this had to take tremendous, tremendous coordination with an organization this big just to kind of get all the moving parts continuing to move as smoothly as they have for a number of years. So talk about what it took to integrate so many different organizations and to get everybody kind of like uh, kind of singing the same song, if you will. Talk about what that was like. Sure, Bert. Thanks. Um, so thinking back on this, I've been at Hackensack for 22 years now, and it was its own hospital. We weren't part of a network when I had first started. And then we grew to a four-hospital network, and then we merged with Bernie, became a 16-hospital network when JFK came in. And now with Carrier Clinic, we're up to, I think, 17 hospitals now. And it's been a lot of fun to be in this kind of growth environment, um, so many opportunities. And in EMS, um, one of the things that was really important to us, and it, it's been wonderful working with uh, JFK and Allure and their teams because there's so many synergies. Uh, when we found out that we were merging with JFK, people started calling, like, we can't wait to work with you. And that was before, you know, anything official really was, um, was started with our integration teams. And now that we've been working together for probably, John, we've been working together for two years now. Um, and, you know, the, the last year with JFK as part of our triad, um, one of the first things we did was focus on our clinical protocols. And the reason we did that was because, you know, figuring out business structures and ambulance structures and equipment and all those things, is very complicated. Supply chain boggles my mind sometimes. But when you talk about patient care and the quality we deliver, it was very easy to sit down and open our, our policy manuals up and say, well, what are you doing? And the clinicians are so passionate about the work they do, and they, tr- they believe in quality. Um, and once they focus on that quality and we talk about, like, well, these decisions are easy to make. It's not about fighting over, like, you know, well, we like this and you like that. It's what's right for the patient. And when you have three programs and the leadership is focused on what's right for the patient, that was actually a lot easier for us to accomplish than we thought it was going to be when we first sat down. And it really doesn't matter what sort of field or industry it is. If you have passionate people that care about doing the best job possible, and in your particular case, saving lives and helping out patients and helping out people in need, uh, if people are passionate about it and want to do the best job possible, everybody's together. It's just a matter of kind of getting the parts to kind of move smoothly, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful stuff. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left here, and I want to thank everybody for coming on by today. Uh, Mark, just some final thoughts from you about what this has meant to you uh, for what you do on a day-in, day-out basis. And again, if you could just kind of remind people why this is such a, an important part of the overall mission. Sure. I think for us at JFK Medical Center, um, you know, a standalone community hospital, um, you know, relatively small in the grand scheme of things, to join a system that is responsible for 1.2 million lives and really to work alongside of people like Michelle and John who have very similar philosophies for patient care and very similar ideas about what the future of healthcare looks like, we suddenly find ourselves in a place where maybe we're sort of driving that future and it won't be dictated to us, but maybe we'll be the ones who are able to shape it. I think for all three of us, that's what keeps that passion alive and what really keeps our eyes focused on the horizon because there are definitely better ways to do what's being done right now. And, you know, some of that just involves involves having a little bit more power than we had before and maybe a little bit more of a geographic footprint than we had before. Uh, It's easier to test new ideas. It's easier to uh, implement strategies that affect the greater good and the community at large. And we find ourselves involved in a network that's very much interested in those things as well. So uh, from the community hospital perspective, it is great to be a part of a forward-thinking and progressive organization like Hackensack Meridian Health. And it's great to be sitting alongside John and Michelle, uh, two organizations that I know share the same passion for quality. Excellent. I thank you for coming on the show today as well. And uh, Michelle, you get the last word. So you get to kind of bring it home and and kind of summarize the whole thing. And just some final thoughts from you, if we could. Sure. Bert, thank you for having us. What I really think is that EMS is probably one of the most exciting areas of healthcare to be in right now. I think that the changes, even nationally, of what's going on, what we bring as value to the healthcare system. We've gone, we started out in public safety, that's where we began, and it was about moving people to hospitals. And as we said earlier, we're bringing care to the patients. And 
there's a you know future where patients won't have to even go to the hospital to get the same level of care that we're giving now. And being able to treat people in their homes, being able to get people to the right services, being able to connect those map dots across the, the steed and, and whatever the future holds for us, I think that the value of EMS is really going to become apparent as we move into the next phase of healthcare for America. Excellent. Well, Michelle and John and Mark, thank you guys all again for being here and keep up the amazing work. And it was great to have you on the show here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. I'm Bert. Thanks for listening to JFK Spotlight on Health. And until next time, you have a healthy day. The new Talk Radio 1450 WCTC, the voice of Central Jersey. The Garden Show with Peggy Ballister Howells. Hi, I'm Peggy Ballister Howells, host of The Garden Show. Whether it's planting seeds in the spring, battling summer insects, planting fall bulbs, or tending house plants throughout the winter, there's always a way to play in the dirt. Share your garden adventures with us Sunday mornings from 8 to 10. The new Talk Radio 1450 WCTC, the voice of Central Jersey. At 29, I'm probably a little young to fit your image of a veteran in a wheelchair. But the war in Iraq, like all wars, is taking its toll on our young men and women in uniform. I became paralyzed when the vehicle I was riding in turned over. Jason came home to an intensive care unit, and we faced a bureaucratic nightmare just to get the services he needed. Thank goodness Paralyzed Veterans of America was there. They said, you focus on your rehabilitation, and we'll take care of the rest. Since 1946, Paralyzed Veterans of America has fought to ensure that our spinal cord injured veterans receive all the care they have earned. PVA also advocates for accessibility and civil rights for all people with disabilities and sponsors research to find a cure for paralysis. Life is full of new challenges for our family. Thank you, PVA, for helping us meet them. Call 1-866-USA-4-PVA. Do you or someone you know need help meeting life's challenges? Are you or a friend feeling sad, lonely, facing tough issues with a spouse or kids, or just overwhelmed by life and aren't sure what to do? Women Helping Women is here to help. Caring and compassionate professional counselors are ready to provide affordable individual or group counseling support and guidance. No insurance required. Metuchen and Piscataway counseling locations are available. To schedule an appointment or get information, call 732-549-6000 or go to whwnj.com. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm Robbie. Hi, I'm David. I'm Amira. Today, tens of thousands of children in this country are in foster care. My dream is to be a professional soccer player. My dream is to be an artist. My dream is to be a chef. My dream is I want to be a doctor. These children have great promise and big dreams. But right now, they're just kids in the system. I'm just a kid. A kid. I'm a kid. A kid waiting to be adopted. Finding Forever Families for Children in Foster Care is the mission of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Dave himself was adopted and knew what it was like to live in uncertainty. So he created a foundation to make adoption easier. If you've ever considered foster care adoption, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption is here to help. What these children want most is to be permanently adopted by a family that will love them forever. Perhaps one like yours. For the facts on adopting a child from foster care, please visit our website at DaveThomasFoundation.org. Your kids are going for a bike ride, you make sure they wear a helmet. They insist on skateboarding, add knee pads and elbow pads too. Swimming in the pool, water wings, goggles, earplugs. If we could pack our kids in bubble wrap, we'd do it. Because we love them and we want to protect them. This is Lisa Edelstein with some very important news. Now there's an easy way to protect your kids three times a day. Choose healthy foods. Research has shown that a vegetarian diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains can help protect our kids against obesity. It can even help keep them from developing heart disease or cancer when they grow up. My friends at The Cancer Project are just waiting to hear from you so they can send you important information on how to protect your children from the inside out. Just log on to cancerproject.org or call 866-906-WELL. That's 866-906-WELL. This message brought to you by The Cancer Project.